Call the November 4, 2013 USD 350 Board of Education meeting to order. Welcome visitors. Uh, any additions or changes to the agenda? Did you say that with a straight face? <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Rickle? No. Uh, there are no changes to the agenda. All right. Entertain a motion to approve the agenda. Ms. President, I move yes. that we approve the agenda as presented. Second. And then second to approve the agenda as presented. All in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried. Six up. He's a tricky one, Bill. You got to pay attention. Uh -huh. President Fisher, I need to know who did the second. Yes. Bill did. Bill. Thank you. Who are you speaking with? Uh, consent agenda. You have that uh, information in your packet. Uh, the budget report was not included in your packet. That's a uh, hard copy in front of you there. Uh, with our transition and financial software, we've, we're pretty much there. So it should come regularly. And in one format now, so you'll notice the bills are in the in a different format, but just one format, unlike the three you saw last time. Any questions about the consent agenda, Mr. President? I move the consent agenda as presented. Second. Move and second to approve the consent agenda as presented. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those nay. Motion carried 6 0. Any patron comments tonight? Okay. Move on to the business agenda. Enrollment report. Um, what you had in your packet was what was actually submitted to the state. Just a tiny bit different than what uh, we discussed at the last meeting. <coughs> um, this is. Uh, information, you know, we don't you know, publicize this really. Uh, these, these things go in the Form 150 when we set the budget. Uh, and that's on our website, but that's when we set the budget, and this is what reality is now. Uh, so our regular enrollment, the FTE for our enrollment, uh, that is, you know, kindergartners count as half, unless they're, they have an IEP, then they're counted full. Uh, full day and preschool kids we only count half if we have any kids going part-time they only count uh, for less than 1.0 so you add all those up we had that 332.2 we don't have any virtual ed students uh, the four-year-old at risk that's a special state program uh, that some school districts have that helps fund preschool we're not part of that we have no hope of being part of that there's not going to be new money, but that's what that is. Um, <clears throat> then we have the total, and then it gives three years of enrollment data. Why is that important? Because we can use this year's enrollment, last year's enrollment, or the average of three years. So that helps because this year is our highest, and next year we'll be able to use this number again. So it kind of helps smooth out the budget shortfall if we would have a loss of enrollment. Uh, so that's what that adjusted enrollment is, that's our total. The bottom one in that first uh, table there, the low and high enrollment, very large school districts and small school districts get extra weighting and that's what that 157 is. There's a formula that uh, based on our number of kids this is the extra that we get. The weighting is what we get for uh, various things. Our vocational classes, career and technical education, that's what that is, CTE. That's the FTE that we get um, based on the number of kids we have taking those classes in, in the industrial arts and the family and consumer sciences and art. Uh, <clears throat> then we have the bilingual students. Uh, if students are in with an ESL certified teacher, that adds to our weighting. Uh, the free meals, the high density at risk, that's if we have above 35% of our student population is free lunch, then we get extra weighting there. 
and then the next one we have there is the transportation we get some extra waiting there so you add all of those up that's how we get our budget so that this first column here the subtotal that's our total FTE between all those waitings and all the kids uh, that's the total then the special education state aid that's what the state gives us we pay that on to the co-op so that's not money we get extra it's just money that flows through and they assign an FTE for that so our total enrollment is about 708 which gives us that general fund budget um, this is a lot far off from where we talked last time but now it's officially been submitted <clears throat> so all of these things um, I had budgeted a little high anyway I had estimated about 2% high just in case uh, then we can use all of that money and we didn't have to republish uh, with this our general fund not including the special ed flow through because we can't really spend that it's going to be about $85,000 higher than it was last year and our local option budget you notice this here we have our computed LOB is 922,000 and the adopted LOB was 903 well we can't republish that we can republish our general fund to get from where we budgeted, which was this number here, the 28676. We can republish that and uh, have the higher number for our general fund. We cannot do that with the local option budget. Uh, so that's why we estimate a little high. And the unfortunate thing is, I guess it's unfortunate, we're, we're higher than I even anticipated and uh, cushioned for. And that happened last year as well. So I budgeted higher this year and uh, didn't budget high enough. So uh, we will have to republish likely. So there's about $110,000 best case scenario to fill our budget gap. Uh, or excuse me, $130,000. We have about $110,000 budget gap. So we had talked before about two ways to fix our budget hole, cut expenses or increase revenue. We don't have control of the revenue, but uh, I think this will fill that hole and help us level off that decrease in cash balance. So this is subject to the audit. Uh, usually we'll lose a few FTE in the audit. They find some things we didn't, uh, you know, we counted wrong, or, uh, things like that. So uh, we still need to consider our, our expenditures, and we'll kind of talk about that uh, uh, over the next month or so. So I did want to update you on the enrollment. And uh, that other page was similar to what we saw last month with our enrollment, FTE, and kind of what that's done over the past several years. And then our free and reduced lunch count. It's been fairly flat in the last five years. Kind of down and up. Any questions about any of the enrollment information? Or It seems positive. It's very positive. It, it, it is uh, makes makes things a lot more comfortable. And the only question mark now is the audit and where we end up there. So. Anybody have questions, Mr. Mark? So you have to do the audit before we republish it to make sure. That we yeah. need to, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. When was that going to take place? I have before? not heard. Uh, I asked him for an early audit. Last year it was in December uh, when I asked for an early audit. And I have not heard. You haven't heard from them either. Usually they'll send a letter when they're going to do it. So. Who's they? The KSD, the State Department of Education. They come out and count all of our kids and all the numbers that we submit and all the documentation there. But it won't be a lot different than this. Okay, thank you. Moving on to student achievement <clears throat> data. Uh, in your packet, I included a couple of pages. Uh, this is our the new way of uh, saying whether we're accredited or not, whether we're a school in Kansas that can 
award diplomas and uh, get state funding. Uh, if you remember in the past, you heard a lot about No Child Left Behind and AYP, Adequate Yearly Progress. This is the new format. Now, if you remember about this time last year, we talked about state assessments and we're moving to new standards and uh, we had told the staff we don't care about the old assessment. Focus on the new standards and we need to focus our efforts there and that's how we've been working. And that's the way a lot of schools did, school districts did this past year. It doesn't make sense to work on the old standards when we're, we're moving to a new tougher standard. Uh, but the state was still in that mode of we have the old test, we're going to give it. So really we're looking at this information here as a way to understand how it's going to work in the future and in this year. Uh, let me sh and there's a lot more data I didn't include in the in the packet, but I'll show it to you here. And I've shared this information with staff, and some of it, I'm not going to go into detail on all of it, but I just want you to be aware of, of all the different types of data we have. It's not all state assessments. It's not all just tests in the classroom. So our new accreditation model, we have four different ways we can look at that. Before it was just how many kids do we have proficient on the state assessment, and are we at that percentage or not? And this year was the year we were supposed to be at 100%, which I think you all know was not never going to happen uh, to be 100%. So now instead of looking at just one measure, we have four different measures that we can look at. We have to meet one of those to say we're, we, made, we made it. So those four, uh, they, we love acronyms in uh, education, so our annual measurable objectives, the AMOs, this is one of them, achievement. The old model with AYP, this red line would be, uh, these kids did not pass, these kids did, so the only way we got rewarded was if we got a kid from below this red line to above the red line. Well, if my kid's performing at this level, I still want my kid to do better. I still want them to move up. So with this new system, this assessment performance index, points, I guess you'd call it, are awarded for each level. And if a kid moves from the bottom level to this level, there's more points awarded. So it shows growth for our school. Uh, we can look at that, and I, I would say that's growth. Uh, and if my kid moves from this level to this level, that's still growth, but before it was just above that red line. We've talked about this a little bit, so uh, I'm not sure how much of this you remember. But the state would set a goal, so we get a number like 650. Now, what does that mean to everybody? Not a lot, but the point is then we'll have a target for how much we want to see that grow each year, and that's different for each building. So one building might be 9 points, one building might be 15 points. So we have that measure. Then there's a measure of growth. So we just average all of our kids, how much did they grow in percentile points. You know, if, if a kid is scoring at the 75th percentile, next test they're scoring at 78th, then a growth of 3 percentage points. Uh, so we average that and compare it with all the schools in the state. The top half, if we're in the top half of all of the schools in the state, we meet that growth measurement. So really half of the schools in the state will achieve this uh, just because they're in the top half of the state. So half will make it, half will not on that one. There's also an area of reducing the gap. What we do is we compare the top 30% in the state. That's the benchmark. All, all of the kids in the state, the top 30%, what are they, what's their average? Uh, and then our bottom 30%, how are they performing? So we want to get those, those kids that are not performing well, we want to get them up. We want everybody to be improving. We want, we want them to, I guess, improve at a faster rate. So we, the goal is to reduce that gap. We looked at that gap last year. What is that gap? We want to reduce that in half in six years. And then the other one is reducing non-proficiency. So we still kind of have that 
which kids are below the red line and which kids are not uh, ab above the red line. Uh, so the ones that are below the red line, we want that number to be cut in half in six years. Okay. So we have those four measures of how we can make it. Uh, so our data is what was included in your packet. <clears throat> Achievement, this is for reading for the district, and this is for math. So this blue line shows what that assessment performance index, that score, when we tabulate all the points, how have we done? So our goal was to get to uh, uh, 709, and we actually got to 702. So we didn't achieve the goal that the state set for us in reading. But we did improve by three on that score. Uh, math was a different story. We went down. And again, it's, it's tough to look at this data and not think, well, what are we doing wrong? What do we need to fix? It's back up a year ago, and we said, we don't care about that test move toward the new standards. Uh, so we performed worse. This was our goal, and that's where we hit as a district. And then each building would have the same data. So the elementary school would have their data, and the junior high and high school has their data. Uh, so we try to look at this and figure out how, we'll, um, how does this all work, and what does that mean for us. Reading, our average growth for our kids, we were in the 70th percentile. So we were better than most schools in the state in reading. Math, uh, we weren't quite at the 50th percentile, but we were close. And then the gap reduction, this would be the top 30% in the state. This was our bottom 30% last year. So that gap, we want that to go, be cut in half. So our goal was to increase this group by 30 points. That's quite a bit for for that group. And we didn't make that. We improved a little bit, but not enough. Uh, in math, same story as the last graph. We actually did worse last year than we did the year before with those kids. And then this is the reducing non-proficient. So a lot of numbers there. We look at different groups also. So we're not just looking at all kids, we're looking at our special ed kids, our free and reduced press lunch kids, and uh, so there's a target for each group. And then after all of that, we get that other sheet that was in your packet. <coughs> which areas did we meet, which areas did we not? So these would be your four areas, and this. We have to make one of those. Reading, we made it in growth. We didn't make it in any of the others. Uh, we almost made it in the reducing non-proficient, but we have to meet it for every group. We didn't actually meet it for the white kids uh, group. And then math, we didn't make it in any of those areas. And then we still have a goal for all of our kids need to participate and, and uh, certain graduation rates. <coughs> Questions about any of that? We'll see more of that. Uh, in the upcoming years. This is the model that that's going to be used, which I think is good. It makes a lot more sense. It's a lot more complicated than saying 75% of our kids are proficient. But. So what do we need to do in math? I mean, do we need to get different textbooks? or Because, I mean, in years past, we've always grown. I can't believe we've fallen off. Um, I think we're doing it with our, uh, our curriculum work. That's, that's a big part of it right now, is making sure we know what we're supposed to be teaching and we're on the same page, page on the same page we're supposed to be teaching. All through, through all grade levels. Which grade levels is the worst, do you know? I can't tell you off the top of my head. I can look. But, uh, but really, with all of this, I wasn't focused on, on this test at all. I wasn't looking at what, how did we perform on that test. 
I'm not as concerned to that. Uh, let me show you one more thing. We do have data on this. This is probably the most important thing we've gotten out of last year's state assessments. This, uh, there were some of the new standards in this old text. So they threw some items in there to do that. This probably helps us more than looking at the results of the old test. Uh, only, only looking at that. Because these are our new standards and where we're headed and how we compare. I just picked third grade reading uh, just as an example to show it. But so there was four of those standards that were on that last year's test. Math, there was there was a few more. So the teachers having that and looking at how did we actually do on those standards last year that we're going to be doing this year. So some things to remember. Again, like we mentioned before, the test, that state assessment did not matter. We weren't concerned about it. We're accredited this year. Uh, we'll be accredited next year. Through this year, the test still doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, so it's a transitional assessment. It probably means more this year because it's going to include more of the new standards. Uh, and then the, the ultimate state test that we're going to be taking for the next several years, that decision hasn't been made yet, but they should have that decision made, I think, this month not next month from the State Board of Education. So my message to the staff is still <coughs> focus on those new standards. Don't focus on test prep on a few. What's been happening over the years, and we did it at Burton, uh, and a lot of schools did that. You have this, many, uh, this much of the curriculum, and we test this much. So we take those, and we cram on those. And we do really well at that. But you know, in the end, at the end of the year, we only do really well at that, and there's so much more. Uh, so, and, and I'm not saying that's what we've done here, but a lot of schools have done that. So in the end, I don't want them focused on that little bit. I want them focused on everything that, that matters and kids need to be successful. Some other data is our uh, career and college readiness. There's two tests we take. ACT, and then the plan is the, like the pre-ACT, the 10th graders take that. The problem with looking at ACT data is we don't not see every kid. So, so we have a different grouping uh, each year. And here's our five-year averages. I know some of this is tough to read, um, and I can send this to you if you'd like to see it. Uh, here's a, the ultimate score, the composite score. This is 2009 to 2013, and we've been above the state average a few years and below a few years, and this is, I think, in every category. Last year was our worst scoring year over the past five years, but I don't see a trend there. And then here's the, the average scores in each category. This one's English. This is math. The reading. And science. And then we see the percent. And what ACT does is they say there's a certain level of a score that a kids need to achieve to say they're ready for college level work. So you hear a lot of that college and career ready. This is the percentage in red of our kids that made, uh, met that benchmark. This is 62% in uh, English, 31 in college algebra, 15 in social science, which is really reading. It's what they're testing there. Uh, biology or science is 23%. And then kids that met all four would be 8%. So this data means a lot more to me than those state assessment scores, but you also notice it's tough to say that this judges our school when we only had 13 of that class taken. And it's the same every year, it's not any different last year. But it's hard to gauge those kids that aren't, how are we doing with those kids that aren't going to a university? 
So good information, but I uh, use it for what it's worth. This is on the uh, uh, by subject, the history on the ACT of the percentage of kids that met that benchmark, that red and yellow graph. So we can look at a lot of a lot of different data here, and then the plan test. This is all tenth graders take this, so this means a little more because all of our kids are taking it, and it's not their senior year. Uh, so we can we can do something about it. What this is now, keep in mind the plan test only goes up to 32. ACT goes up to 36. Uh, so the scores, the numbers probably don't mean a whole lot to you, but the national average is the one on the top. Last year's sophomores would be this one. Last year's juniors, when they were sophomores, two years before that would be this one. And then the year before. So you can kind of see how that data bounces around a little bit. Last year's sophomore class, fairly close to the national average. <clears throat> two years before that, you can see our, which would be our current senior class, for the high achieving group there. Is that national average, a, uh, I mean, does it change every year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. really the number is, I mean, what year is the national average? It, it's probably more steady than ours. Uh, I'm, I'm sure it is. This one won't bounce around much. All right. And then the same type of stuff we can look at, those college readiness benchmarks. This doesn't mean that they're ready for college now, it means they're on track to be ready. So down here, this is our data, this first one. For English, we have 64% of the kids, I know this is under agree. Math, last year's sophomores, 16%. Reading was 32, and then science was 16. And then the national average is the one next to it. Then Ames Web, uh, this is a test we give to our elementary kids and in various areas of math, uh, well actually two areas of math, computation and then problem solving, and then various areas of reading depending on the grade level. <coughs> so this is just one example. I won't go through all of this data, I just wanted to throw it out at you to show you. There's a lot of data we, we do look at in addition to just the state assessment test. But this, the gray is our kids. Let's look at fourth grade. There's about a fourth of that class in this area, a fourth of the class in that area, a fourth of the class in that area, and the rest of them here. This dark line is the target. That's where we want them to be. And this was the fall of this year. They actually took that test. So we know that you know, almost three-fourths of that class is performing at, at or above the target. We also know that about that same amount is performing better than half of the kids in the state. So we're doing, doing pretty well on that grade. And again, I'm not going to go into detail on all of these. Um, here's one for reading. So ideally we want to see more of our kids above that dark line than below it. So this one we have more than half our kids performing below the target in grade two as of this fall. And each kid would be identified with a target. Uh, if they're really struggling, they need extra help, maybe some title help, something like that. This is one of our uh, uh, early reading. There's several they do for that. Uh, you see in our kindergarten, nearly all of our kids are above the target. There. So all of this, what is the whole this about? It's more than just looking at our state assessment score. What does one score in one day mean? It's a lot more about improvement and getting better with all of our kids. So
any questions about any of that uh, data? You go over this with the teachers on the service work days? Or? Mm -hmm. We just did uh, a couple weeks ago. Yeah, this very, very thing. And I think uh, with our school improvement goals, we do need to be looking at some of this data a lot more. And uh, not just come this time and present it. We look at it and say, how did we do? But looking at it on a regular basis. And probably do a better job of that at the lower grades with those kids that are struggling. But. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Mm -hmm. KASB Board Policy Service. Uh, this is one of those things we really need to get uh, uh, get cleaned up. We've talked about it several times with our board policy handbook. The blue book is it over there. Uh, it's there's I believe, yes, a thousand pages, and uh, we've got updates over the past ten years or so on a computer file. Uh, the tough thing is, even this year we've got we've got them on a computer file, but what do I do with those? I can print them off and put them in the book, and then uh, down the road, what do we do with those? How do I know those are updated? So we're checking computer files, checking that, and being able to communicate that to the public. If somebody wants to see what's your policy on this, uh, we don't have it accessible. We have to pull it out. And then, uh, so. What KSB will do is go through our board policy book, uh, make sure we're up to date on things. If there's things we have locally that might be different than what the state, you know, what most school districts have, which we do have uh, a lot of that, like every school district does, that will be part of our uh, <coughs> our new handbook. Uh, they charge five thousand dollars to do a full policy audit. It means they look at our negotiated agreement, our student handbooks, our staff handbooks, any any other uh, policies we have that might not be formal policies in that book. Um, a partial audit would be just the blue book. They'll take our board policies, get them in an electronic format, and uh, uh, we can search them. Uh, boy, that's pretty handy when you can just search for something rather than try to wade through that book. So it's not cheap. It's a fairly significant expense of three thousand dollars, but I think it's something we need to do. Um, there is the contract for that. If you're curious about that on pages twenty-one to twenty-three. They will come out. Uh, the board can be in, involved as involved as you'll want to be, or be as hands off and let me take care of it with them. Uh, as you want to be. They can come out and present. And, uh, so once you we get this book updated, then you can keep it updated. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. When we get the updates in electronic <coughs> format, we would just take that that master copy of the electronic uh, board policy book, put the new form in, put the new policy in, and delete the old policy, and it's updated. And it's <coughs> And each year, it's it's just a matter of doing that. Delete a page here and insert a page in its place. And have a copy on the website. You all can access that. The public can access that as they need to. This is not something I, I think we can tackle on our own. If we were just going to scan it and move on with life, that'd be one thing. But making sure all of the policies are in order is what we need to have. That's where KSB, that's what we're paying for. If we want them to, they'll take our book and scan it, send it back. But it's a lot more than just that. Mr. President, I move the board approve the contract for a partial policy audit for $3,000. There's a second. Second. Move and second in to uh, approve the contract for a partial policy audit and the amount of three thousand dollars. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, aye. All right. Aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carried 6 0. Okay. Office.
this reorganization? Um, this has been one of those issues that we've discussed as a board off and on informally. Um, you know, since I got here, it's it's kind of bugged me how we've how we operate uh, with. Uh, it, before we had Kathleen helping us out in the offices, it, it would be me, and Julian, in the district office, uh, with Travis and Marla in the elementary office, and then you know when Julian's gotten to lunch, I'm going to cover. Uh, or if she's gone, we'll find somebody, or if we can't find somebody, I would cover. Um, I'm probably more flexible than Travis, uh, you know, as a principal. But when an issue comes up, he's got to go. You got to go take care of it. Leaving the office unmanned uh, is not good practice. Uh, people come in uh, to do business, whether it's with the district office or the elementary office, uh, and expect it to be open. We keep those doors unlocked so uh, so people can can do their business. So uh, the other issue is with our district office, the way it operates. Uh, you know, Marla does a lot of district uh, has a lot of district office duties. Uh, she does transportation with the buses. Julian does transportation with the cars. Uh, Marla handles the purchasing and uh, some of the data entry on the budget, and then Julian handles uh, the budgeting. Uh, our payroll, Marla does classified, Julian does certified, Julian's in charge of human resources. There's a lot of things that we don't communicate well because we're in different offices. Ideally, those ought to be together. I feel very strongly about that. Uh, also, I feel very strongly that we need to cover an office all day long. We need to have somebody there every hour of the day uh, that, that we're saying it's open. Uh, what I sent to you here, we've got some options. Um, we do nothing. We can just maintain what we're doing. Uh, and this kind of all came about because Kathleen decided she can't. Uh, she can't handle all this she has to do. She's working there the after-school program and uh, uh, going to school, and it was just too much for it. So, uh, so we could maintain what we're doing. And I have talked to Kathleen. She will cover over the lunch hour, so just a couple hours a day. So that would get us by. Uh, the other option would be to hire someone to replace what Kathleen was doing for a few hours a day. Uh, I believe that's an expense we don't need. I believe if we combine some things, will be more efficient. Um, another option would be to combine the elementary and high school offices. I think the only place to do that would be in the high school office. Then you just operate all of the school issues out of one office and district issues out of the other office. Uh, we did talk with staff uh, last week. Uh, they're not supportive of that. And there's, there's a lot of good reasons why it's not uh, it's not the best option, um, especially with our early ed building being separate. Uh, that makes it even more difficult. Uh, and you know, if, if if your best people don't support something, it's kind of hard to uh, say it's a good idea. Uh, the other option would be to combine elementary and district offices. Uh, we couldn't really do that in existing office space. We had talked before about building something between the buildings and connecting the early ed building. That's that's a lot of money to do something like that. Uh, Vance mentioned not, not too long ago about what if we took one of these classrooms and made some office space. Um, and I think that's definitely a viable option. Um, this is what I sent to the architect. Uh, I just told them we'd be visiting about it. He wanted to see some pictures. Uh, you know, we've been working with the architect on the bathroom and the uh, library situation. So I sent this to him. So I, I know you guys know where a lot of these things are. Most of these words were for them. But. So the district office would be abandoned. And we would take a classroom down the elementary area. This is Cindy Falk's room. 
It's down at the east end of the building. It's the south facing entrance, uh, kind of right there on the east end of the, the preschool building, the early end building, that entrance there. And then this wall over here um, where the chalkboard is, that's actually a sheetrock wall. Most of our walls are 16 inch thick concrete, but that's sheetrock uh, drywall, studs and drywall that separates that classroom from the teacher workroom. Which is here. That's the teacher workroom and that wall with the clock on it is the opposite side of that one with the chalkboard. And this is the exterior there. So this door over here would be Cindy Falk's room and then the one past the drinking fountains is where that uh, workroom is. And of course, our, we would need some help with this, but this is just some thoughts about what we could do. We could have two offices there and then an outer office area for Julianne and Marlon. We would operate the elementary office and the district office out of that area. And one thing we could do with this is, you notice the, uh, the bottom there says new doorway new door from outside entryway. This could be a setup where this is the view from inside. That entryway where you have the exterior doors and then a new, another set of doors just inside that. We could put a door in here that goes into that office where these doors could be locked. And when people come in the building, they have to go into the office to get into the building. And then this could be the new main entrance to the elementary school in the district office. That's a lot more attractive area than uh, coming down the alley to uh, the shared parking lot. What well, like the idea of kids or parents having to go through the office to get back in the building that way they could kind of monitor who's coming in and out. Um, Barb had mentioned in it, uh, we emailed a couple of times about, you know, it'd be, it's kind of tough when you have two administrators sitting next to each other, that do we really need both of them? Uh, which is a valid, valid question, and people will have that. Um, I think it's more about what those people have to do, not where their office is, but it is a, an important question. I don't think it changes if we put people in certain places. But that being said, um, depending on what enrollment does and what our budget does, we may end up at a point where we just have two administrators in the district. This setup would be ideal for that, to have one administrator in the, in the high school office and one down at this end, which Let's just say Travis was not here, and right now in our current situation, if I took over the elementary principal duties, that would have to be in my office. We couldn't do that out of the elementary office, so we would be without a, a, an administrator in that, that way. So I think this would set us up that if we do need to reduce administrative staff, that would be setting this up to do that if it's necessary. And that's not what I'm recommending at this time, but it is an important point. Sorry, I didn't mean to throw you through the bus there. That's fine. Um, do you have a job description of what all the secretaries do, if there's a way to? Um, because the jobs have changed a lot <clears throat> since. Sort of. I mean, we have old job descriptions, which haven't been updated in a long time. We don't have it put together for Julian and Marla, but I did ask Susan and Dee to put down there, what are they doing, what are they handling, what's their, not their job description, but what are they actually doing, what are their responsibilities. So. It would be interesting to see, because 
you know, several years ago, the elementary did the transportation and the newsletter. And the high school did the uh, activities account and mm -hmm. a lot of the keeping. And junior high did more of the lunchroom and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and then it all ended up in the district office. I was just wondering if that could come, some of that could come back out and not be so much of a burden on Marla and Julianne. Um, yeah, I think it, I mean, we could tweak some duties. Uh, are you thinking that would help with, that we wouldn't have to move people? Well, it's not so much that, it's, it's uh, I don't know, I'm just, uh, Oh, it's all right. It, I, I think we do need to look at what everybody's, what everybody is doing, and what duties they ought to have, and make more sense. Yeah. You know, I mean, like I said, it just not put the burden on one office and things mm -hmm. to run the whole school. So, because I don't know if the superintendent is necessarily made to run the school. I think it's more of a you're the, the chief in charge, and then everybody else below you is supposed to do that. And it seems like a lot of that stuff has been put in on the superintendent's office, mm -hmm. where maybe it could be spread out a little more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, it seemed to work before, but times have changed, bookkeeping's changed, yeah. documents have changed, so I don't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think ideal, uh, an ideal office setup would be to have a district office and I would have a secretary and we'd have a full-time elementary secretary, but I think that's, uh, you know, and that, that was, those positions were cut for budgetary reasons. And, you know, I think the ideal situation would be to hire an elementary secretary and move Marlowe over to my office, but I don't see that as a feasible option financially now. So uh, how, how did this go over with the teachers? And um, Danette and Russell actually brought up that, hey, we've got you know, our title rooms, we could combine and, um, and utilize some classroom space. Uh, so that, that idea you know, came from them as well. Um, and it's very important for them to have a principal in that area. Okay. Well, I would agree with that. And it is for me as well. It's uh, well, a safety issue. Nothing else. Are there any? Are there still any aides or anything that could help relieve some of that lunchroom issue? Um, oh, for uh, teachers' uh, aides. To watch the office during the lunch hour, mm -hmm. you know, we use, we use them to supervise the lunchroom and to help out at recess, uh, which is also the area we run into with, you know, it would be, be nice if we could pull Susan or Dee over to the elementary office while Marla's at lunch, but they're, what, they're doing lunch count and all that. So a lot of those duties are happening during lunch. So the time where we need the help, it's well, so we're, we're, we're using them. The staff, so they're we are, we're lunching kinda, earlier, and we kind of already do that. Do yeah, just because they have to get a lunch at some point too, yeah. and so if we did this, you're wanting to do it right away or wait till summer? What are you thinking? Well, what I'm thinking, thinking is this summer we would do the major remodel. We could include that with our bathroom project. Um, and I don't think this will be a huge expense. Um, I'm talking about you know, drywall and uh, a little electrical that goes along with it and some floor and ceiling. And, you know, punch a hole in the wall that might uh, cost some money. But. And then, uh, like I meant, uh, Kathleen is willing. I called her back and said, Hey, could you just help us during the lunch hour? So she can fill in for a couple hours during lunch. She's still helping out with the after school program. So she can kind of help us cover lunch. 
uh, to get us through the year. Um, so you don't think no, nobody needs to be on the high school side then? No, no, Mike would still be over there. <coughs> or you mean on the, where my office is yeah. now? Um, no, I think we would be just fine without that. There's not issues I deal with over there. Um, you know, I make my way through the hallway just to see the kids. Um, but, um, and that brings up another point. That, that uh, area we could use for a men's restroom on the main floor. You know, we have that boys' restroom downstairs. That's a weird situation, this, the, the layout of that. But that would open up that office for uh, a restroom on the main floor there. The plumbing would be right there. With the yeah, the plumbing's the right there. Mm -hmm. And there'd probably be room enough for some storage there as well. We have storage issues with our old, old building where we put stuff. I think that if the teachers and everyone is on board with this, that we should add it in with the project we'll be doing this summer. Okay. Well, is that kind of consensus of what? I'm not asking for a decision now, but at least a direction for me to let the architect move ahead and look at this and his proposal and help us consider costs and all that. Okay. Um, and then if we, uh, we'll just kind of get the word out to the staff. This is kind of where we're headed, and some of them already know that anyway. Uh, find a way to communicate that to parents so people are kind of aware of what's going on and what the changes might be. But I think long term it makes sense, and I think short term it does as well. Well, you know, I mean, I'm going to camp with you here. They had a superintendent office was down, basically. Right. We moved it back over to the high school because we thought people need to be able to, and kids need to be able to see and stuff like that. So, I mean, it's just one thing if you're clerk over there, you know, you, you still need to walk through the, yeah. the building and yeah. stuff to make, yeah. make sure you're seeing and stuff. Right. You might actually have time to be seen more. I don't know if it changed that, but I, I try to be out and about. Covering yeah, two every offices day. would be easier than covering three staff yeah. wise. Yeah. 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 Right now, with without any extra help, you know, when Julianne's going to go talk to somebody, I got to make sure mm -hmm. I'm staying there. That's uh, with Kathleen there, it helps. But. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Any other discussion on that? Disposal of excess property. Uh, computers, we've got a, several old computers from the tech lab. We put a, a new laptops in there for our online classes. Uh, those, uh, we have some uh, overhead projectors. I'm pretty sure we won't be able to sell those. Uh, we've got elect, uh, electronic recyclers. They'll come by and uh, pick up our stuff. And, erase everything and they part it out. They, they strip off what they can and, uh, and salvage uh, so they make a little money on the deal. But, but that gets us off our head, uh, off our hands and having to pay uh, landfill fee for, for electronics. So uh, it's all outdated stuff. We just need board approval to get rid of that stuff this week. I well, know that one year we had a bunch of computers that was outdated and sold them for like 50 bucks a piece to the students and stuff. Yeah, these are, these are probably beyond that. Um, and when we do that, Dick has to go through each one and erase everything. And, uh, I, don't, I don't think these are worth that time and effort. If we had some, uh, if they were a little newer, uh, it might be worth it to try that. But. Did I take a motion? 
dispose of the outdated equipment. Mr. President, I move the board approve the disposal of outdated computer and audio visual equipment. Second. So moving and second to dispose of the outdated computer and audio visual equipment. Is there any discussion? Not all in favor, aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carried 6 0. Moving on to communications. Board member activities. Start with you, Bill. Nothing. Tom? Oh, okay. Pardon? I still haven't heard from the PDC. I don't know if there's a meeting or not. There is this week, and I haven't heard <laughs> word on when, so, Yeah. Thursday at 7.30. Thursday at 7.30? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. More than me. And, well, I don't know. It depends. Is it John? Yeah. Is he that yeah. head? Yeah. He puts you on the list, so when an email comes out, you should get it. If uh, I'll check with him, make sure we're meeting this week, because I haven't heard you. Other than the elementary program was really cute. Very nice night. Thank you, elementary teachers. Thank you. Um, Josh and I attended the South Central Co-op meeting. It was a pretty short and sweet meeting. Just continue to watch the budget. It's, it's an issue. So, um, administrative reports, Mr. Meyer. Um, our principals are in Wichita. They're, they're uh, principals conference. Uh, so they they were worried about not being here, and I told them I would give them the report. I, uh, I think it's important for them to go to those things. Uh, this is, uh, these were in your packet, uh, Mr. Allen's report here. Uh, of the students of the month, August Seifke's and Charlie Tanner. Uh, pictured there with Chief Saylor. Our fresh fruits and vegetables program. Uh, we've got grant money for that. Uh, it gets fresh fruits and vegetable snacks to the kids during the day. Mrs. Patterson has taken that on. The kids are coming in and uh, helping with that. That's really neat for, for everybody. That's uh, good for them to see the, the big kids in their classroom. The uh, Fire Prevention Week uh, had activities related to that. Uh, as Barb mentioned, the music program. Uh, they did a great job with that. This year we included fifth and sixth grade with that. And it didn't occur to Mr. Olive, because he's brand new, and it didn't really occur to me till the day of the concert that we might not be able to fit everybody in here the way it was a, it was a packed house. So if we do that again, we'll probably have to do that in the gym or something. But it was, uh, we reached our limit. And then there's a couple of pictures there for MTSS and the first grade art. And list of enrollment. Earlier we were talking about enrollment. And it was uh, 332 was our enrollment FTE. Actually we're at 385 if you count all the heads in, in preschool and uh, everything. Uh, Parent-teacher conferences. Uh, elementary had 90% uh, representation there. And for that school improvement plan earlier each principal there, each building they're coming up with their school improvement plan. We're kind of talking about the data that relates to that. Uh, we've kind of picked their three broad goals here. Uh, increase student achievement, improve the school climate, and uh, classroom technology use. And then at the upcoming this early dismissal, professional development time, they'll be working on objectives for each one of those goals and how they're going to work to meet those. And measure them. Uh, you have your school nurse report. And then uh, he's got a note here about being in Wichita. Seems like a lot of kids going to the nurse. Like nine kids every day. Yeah. Hey, recess, there's probably, there might be nine kids in a day come from recess. Mm -hmm. And it's anything for. You know, 
the ball hit me in the head and I need to ice back. And your kids just like the school bird. Yeah. Yeah. She gives that to you? No. Okay, anything else, Mr. Hunter? Uh, no, on that one. Uh, Mr. Bergen's report here and the enrollment there. Uh, 13 students are doing the online classes uh, now. Nine in pharmacology, one in psychology, one in CNA, and uh, nutrition, and then uh, anatomy and physiology. So those bugs have been worked out. It's going well. Uh, I'm sure we'll see that number a lot higher next year. Uh, November 7th, we have a group coming in to present a, uh, a video on character education and bullying, uh, part of our efforts there. Uh, they have giant, three giant screens that will fill up the whole auditorium at different grade level, uh, appropriate, probably three groups, loud music, and good message there, and then they can uh, discuss that in their classes when that's all done. Uh, Scholars Bowl and uh, parent teacher conferences. Bullying doesn't just happen in high school. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. No. <laughs> and uh, then on the graders playing basketball. Yeah, there's three. There's a total of sixteen, I think. Catch any backlash? No. No. I think it's a good thing now. Play it was only 16 total. Yeah. Yeah. There was. You know, we had 14 seventh eighth graders signed up. It ended up being 13 and three of the um, six graders. Started out with four and one decided not to do it this year. So on the, my report, the teacher career fair, I'm headed to Emporia State tomorrow. Um, we don't really have any positions we're interviewing for right now, but I think that's an important part of recruiting is just being out there and seeing the new new faces. Uh, if if we wait to do these things till March when we have a position open up, it's too late. So uh, it's tough to drive two and a half hours at six in the morning, but uh, and be out of the building, but. I think it's important. Uh, evaluations, you know, this was a big uh, effort last year to get this put together. Uh, it's a lot more time for the principals, uh, but in the end, it's, it's a lot better dialogue for the, the principal and just saying, hey, here's how I think you're doing. Um, and the teachers have the opportunity to submit information to say, hey, here's, here's something I do well, include that in my evaluation. Uh, I went through the first evaluation with each principal set in on the class and we kind of talked through it. Uh, so that's that's going very well. I've been, been pretty happy with that. Um, the book study, the principals and I are doing a book study again this year. This one is uh, what great principals do differently. Um, and it's kind of tough to get together all the time and just sit down and discuss and have much time to do that. We all have so much to do. Uh, but on, this is called Google Drive. It used to be called Google Docs. So we've created a document that we can go in, Travis and Mike and I can go in and type about uh, chapter one, what did you think about that? And then I can read what Travis wrote, he can read what I wrote, and that allows us to collaborate about this book. And uh, I won't show you all of this because I didn't tell them this would be public information, but, uh, but that's kind of a neat way for us to be able to talk about things without having to make time and sit down at a meeting. So that's how we're doing this uh, book study this year. Um, one other item that's not on uh, this, but our site councils. Last year, Andrea started the PTO going again and kind of included site council as part of that. And they haven't really done site council things. I mean, they're doing a good job with the PTO stuff. Site council would be more advisory. When this board needs information or the principals need information or want to get information out, 
uh, about, let's say, the office situation, who are we going to talk to about that? We don't have site councils in place to do that and we need to. So what we're working on is putting together site council at each building level. We'll meet once per quarter all together. So there will be things like this office situation or our other capital improvements or whatever we're talking about that we need some input on. Uh, we'll have those people meeting. So we don't have it all put together, but uh, uh, when we need to get information out uh, to the public and have people on our side, I think that's an important thing. And to get information from them rather than just seeing somebody downtown and we talk to them, but have that organized group. So we're working on that. Uh, the KSB convention um, is coming up on December 6th, 7th, and 8th. Starts Friday, the main part of the convention is the 7th and 8th. Uh, is anybody interested in going is the first question. It's at Wichita, you said? Yeah, it's in Wichita. I could make I can't make the 6th, but I can make the 7th and 8th. Okay. Is that an option? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Skip the first day? Yes. The 6th is more the pre-conference thing. They have the superintendent day that I'll be attending. Uh, and there's some uh, maybe a school law seminar that day, but it's more meetings before the convention. Yeah. I might be able to go. I'll have to look. Okay. Um, it's probably not that bad. Like a good time. Your aunt was looking for you at the last meeting. You guys let her down. December. December 7th and 8th. And, uh, tell you what, I'll send you the program. Um, and that way you have the information if you can let me know this week if you want to go. We'll get you signed up whether you want to stay there or or not. Um, uh, the second question would be, uh, we have a vote in the delegate assembly and there are several issues that uh, we need to have direction on uh, um, how our delegate ought to vote. Chad was deemed our delegate and anybody could be uh, if Chad was not able to make it. Um, I can go through all of these um, if you'd like, but I'll just bring up two of these uh, because they've generated a lot of news and it relates directly to our relationship with the teachers. And, uh, I, think I had a superintendent ask, what's your board's position on this because our teachers union is asking what our board's position is. Uh, One is uh, teacher negotiations. There's a lot of things that we have to negotiate if the teacher's organization wants to uh, negotiate those in the contract. It's been long-standing practice, uh, policy of KSB, that uh, pay and time of work, those are really the only things that boards should have to negotiate. There's been a lot of uh, uproar about that. Um, so they've changed their position to say, should this be what our position is? And this is what we would be voting on, our delegate would be voting on. Uh, so employee relations, strength and board and administrator management, flexibility while maintaining core employee re rights. So we support continuation of collective bargaining between school boards and teacher associations. We believe changes should be made to the Professional Negotiations Act to strengthen professionalism and efficient district operations, <clears throat> which would seek to achieve through negotiations with teacher representatives. So what they're talking about doing is, uh, rather than saying, we only want boards to have to negotiate pay and, uh, uh, and time of work, we should have a group of teachers that works with the school boards association to say, what are the things that we should have to negotiate? So this is a change in policy. Is this board comfortable with that? Are you comfortable with Chad just voting how he feels? Um, I think this is a, a good compromise to what past policy was and the crazy list of things we 
have to negotiate now. And your teachers, our teachers may ask you, what's your position on this? I got lost on what you were all saying there, so. <laughs> You've been on the negotiating group. I haven't any problems, so. I don't have a problem with what we're doing. But so is this, because we have been having um, a negotiator come in and work, is this, this eliminate no, that this or has not nothing for, to do with it? No. This, would, this would change from saying there's, uh, and I don't have the list on here, but the you know dress code, we have to negotiate that if they want to. Um, uh, you know, the, and there's some other things that, that don't make a lot of sense in the job that the teachers have to do. And that's just one example of, of one of those. But we have to negotiate that if, if the teachers want to. So this would be saying, let's take some of those things and reduce them. That should be our policy as a state school board's association. And who decides? Reduce them, but maybe not all the way. And who, who decides what gets reduced? Uh, a a group of, of teacher representatives okay. in NKSB. Uh, I'd say knock yourself out then. Vote for it. I don't have a problem with what they're presenting yeah. here. No. So. And I don't, I'm with Stan, I don't have a big problem with what has been happening in our district yeah. from what I know of the history and the recent history. I don't have a problem with it remaining the same. But on a statewide level, I know some other districts do have issues. The other issue is probably more important, um, I believe, is it affects kids more, is due process. What we're talking about is tenure here. Um, so what happens now is if we need to get rid of a, I don't want to put it that way, if we need to not renew the contract of a teacher who's, who has tenure, uh, they have the right to a hearing with a hearing officer uh, who's a third party that comes in. We have to hire that person. Um, and then there needs to be substantial evidence that this teacher is bad. That's a tough thing to prove. Uh, so they're recommending that uh, we clarify that uh, to allow boards of education to remove teachers as long as the removal is supported by a preponderance of evidence. So that's legal talk for, makes it a little easier to say, there's enough evidence here to say the teacher's not doing their job, it's okay to let this teacher go, whereas now it's very difficult uh, to do. Uh, I think this one is very important and I think it's a pretty good compromise uh, between saying uh, teachers have no tenure, no protection at all, uh, and what we have now. We'd have to ask a lawyer what the difference between substantial and preponderance means. Well, that's but, just it. Is. I mean, you can read that. But well, what their explanation is, and this comes from their legal staff, is Substantial is difficult to prove. That would be without, re without reasonable doubt. Preponderance is a lot more than likely. Everyone can, but uh, I don't know. I don't see a lot of difference. You still have to have a case and you still have to have evidence. <laughs> but, you know, who decides? Whether you have a preponderance of it would still be a hearing officer. You still, you still have an independent, independent have office. Someone. Yeah. So they think this wordiness is weakening the, the process. Process a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you have them come in, in somewhere there was uh, money. I, yeah, I still don't think that it changes that a lot. Okay. Uh, well, the big, the large danger with with trying to non-renew a teacher's a teacher who is tenured is 
if you're not sure that you've got the case, uh, then don't do it because you might be stuck with that teacher forever. Uh, you know, if you lose that case, you're stuck with them. And I think this is a step. Um, I don't know if it's the ultimate answer, but I think it's a step towards something better to allow us to remove ineffective teachers, which makes it better for our kids. And that's what we're talking about. Is we're not talking about getting rid of people. We're talking about removing ineffective teachers. If there's a reason to do it, I still think you know it should be difficult to do and not easy because otherwise. You know, to pick on my kid and, you know, I want him gone, mm -hmm. you know, that's not right. 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 Yeah. But they need protection. I agree with you. That. So. They shouldn't be picking on their kid. Oh, they can pick on them. <laughs> <laughs> so. Somebody will want to go on the teaching field if they don't have someone. Somebody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think get a rid getting rid of tenure completely or due process is the way to go. But needs to be a better system. There'll still be a way that people can work around that. Uh, right. So if you guys are okay with those two, with Chad voting that way on those two, the other ones, I can go through them if you'd like. Or if you're comfortable with Chad making his decision. Mm -hmm. I I got to vote in four on stuff, so okay. you can do it. All right. If if I could do it, I know you can. I will do my best. <laughs> and uh, oops, I lost my train of thought. The Tiger Trail. You have a brochure there. Uh, Janelle Rose with the Bart County Health Department called and said they have some grant money. They'd love to put together a trail for us. Uh, and it was one of those things that I, great, that sounds neat, go ahead and do it. Uh, so they, they had some money to help put out some brochures and uh, uh, ideally we would have had a little more involvement in this, but it was kind of a uh, quick deal, she needed some information. So there's a brochure here. Um, once we get it in, uh, I know the the uh, economic development group is working on some a healthy communities initiative and some walking trails so it might be able to be incorporated with that and changed however we need to so uh, anyway that's what that's all about well i, I got a question uh -huh. um the trails down the middle of the street it's along the side of the street yeah it's the side of the street yeah mm. okay because there's no sidewalks right, right. okay so it's just okay yeah, it's really just this is 1.2 miles, and if you want to know how far you've gone, far you walked, that's exactly. what this yeah. is. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's what it looked like. Yeah, and I think we could do it better with more input and, uh, once we get it started. So, okay. so there's not every once in a while there's something there I can do a pull up on or something. Or no, nothing like no, that. it's not an interpretive trailer. Okay. Anything. All right. Learn yeah, something yeah. about push-ups. Yeah, you yeah. can. Yeah. That's only if I fall down. And I have to push myself back up. <laughs> what I do that. Uh, Van says uh, gathered up some funds from community members for uh, basketball goals to replace the side goals, uh, the fan shape backboards, and get new uh, full size goals. On the side goals, there uh, raised sixty nine hundred dollars. Sixty six hundred. Sixty six hundred. Sixty six hundred. Okay. <coughs> Sixty six hundred dollars uh, to pay for that, uh, and uh, we'll put two new goals in the old gym, and then the four side goals will have those replaced. Uh, weight is a consideration. They weigh about twice as much. Uh, we do have another hoist to lift the goals up. Uh, we have it on hand, it just has never been put in. Uh, so right now, the one hoist pulls up the four side goals, 
uh, the cabling and everything is easy to separate into two. So we'd be able to do, you know, either the south side or north side at the same time. So I don't believe weight will be an issue there uh, with the hoist uh, operating uh, two goals at a time rather than four. And then in the old gym, we have, and that was a concern as well with the weight, we have goals on the side of the structure. We'll take those off. We'll lose about 100 pounds, which should make up for the added weight. So um, we've got four of them in and uh, two more on the way. So um, we'll have those going in as soon as we can get that hoist in, get them up. So uh, very grateful for the community support. Fans, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, it was easy to raise. It took about 36 hours. And I had people call me that I didn't even contact. So. It's neat. It's kind of... we got a lot of support in the community. It's really neat. Is there more we can do with that? The less we have to take out our capital. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't want to cover. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Right, that's all I had you. for uh, my report. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Moving down to executive session, we need uh, with Mr. Meyer and the board 25 minutes to discuss personnel matters. How many? 25 minutes. Mr. President, I move the board go into executive session to discuss personnel matters in order to protect privacy of non-elected personnel with Mr. Meyer to be included and that they return to open session 25 minutes in this room after a short break. Second. Moved and seconded to go into executive session for 25 minutes to discuss personnel matters with the board and Mr. Meyer. All in favor, aye. After a short break. After a short break. Aye. 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 Those men. Motion carried 6 0. Okay. Anything else to brought for the board? Entertain a motion for adjournment? I'll make that motion. Thank you, Chair. Moving second to adjourn. All in favor, aye. Aye. Those men. Meeting adjourned.